Hello, and thank you for joining us today for ShapeUp's Health Behaviors Are Contagious webinar. I'm Sean Levana, Vice President of Marketing at ShapeUp, and I'll moderate today's call. We're here today to hear directly from the researchers who have worked on studies involving the spread of health within social networks. And on today's event, they will share their groundbreaking findings with us and answer any questions you may have. We're going to leave as much time as possible at the conclusion of today's event to answer your questions. So as we go through today's presentation, please ask any questions by using the dialog box on your GoToWebinar control panel in the top right of your screen. We will do our best to get to as many questions as possible, and we'll follow up with you after the webinar if your question goes unanswered live on today's event. I'm joined today by Dr. Luke Matthews, Dr. Trisha Leahy, and Dr. Rajiv Kumar. Dr. Matthews is a researcher at Activate Networks, the company founded by Drs. Nicholas Christakis and James Fowler. At Activate Networks, Dr. Matthews is responsible for the ongoing development and application of the company's algorithms. Dr. Matthews received his doctorate in anthropology from New York University and was a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University, where he worked with Drs. Christakis and Fowler on their landmark studies using data from the Framingham Heart Study. Dr. Tricia Leahy is an assistant professor of psychiatry and human behavior at Brown Medical School and the Miriam Hospital's Weight Loss and Diabetes Research Center. She received her doctorate in clinical health psychology from Kent State University and completed her clinical internship at Brown Medical School. Her research focuses on behavioral interventions for the treatment of obesity and developing treatments to improve bariatric surgery patients' adherence to post-surgical recommendations. Dr. Leahy's recent research was just published in Obesity Magazine, Obesity Journal, the topic of which was how teammates and social influence affect weight loss outcomes in team-based weight loss competitions. Dr. Rajiv Kumar is the Founder and Chief Medical Officer at ShapeUp, and on today's webinar, he will discuss the implications of this research for population health management. Dr. Kumar will start today's presentation, and I'll now turn control over to him. Great. Thank you, Sean, and uh, thank you all for joining us today. We're uh, excited to have so many people who are interested in this topic uh, of how health spreads uh, through social networks. I thought it would be instructive to start off with um, the ShapeUp mission statement. Uh, we, we have a unique mission statement here at ShapeUp, which is we're trying to create a healthier world by leveraging social influence to engage people in healthy activities. And this is really a belief and an a approach that uh, my business partner, Dr. Brad Weinberg, and I came to while we were medical students, and we began to see patients and we began to realize that those patients who worked together with their friends, their family, and their colleagues were much more likely to succeed at changing their behavior and achieving their best health. Now, we knew that this was intuitive and we saw that it was happening, uh, but it took us a couple years before we got around to really diving into the research and understanding how this works and why this happens. And that's why we're really particularly interested today in exploring with researchers who have worked in this space we're going to share with us how do the people around us truly affect our health, why does this happen, and how can we leverage this uh, to make people more likely to achieve their health goals. So this is the agenda for today. Uh, we're going to start off and we're going to hear from Dr. Luke Matthews, who's going to talk about the spread of human behavior in large social networks. And he's going to leverage a lot of the research that Dr. Nicholas Christakis and Dr. James Fowler have done, uh, but he's going to share, us, share with us even more uh, than just that. Uh, once we cover that topic of how, do, how does human behavior spread in social networks, we're going to look specifically at an intervention that was designed to leverage social influence to make people healthier. Uh, we're going to look specifically at an intervention called Shape Up Rhode Island, uh, which is a nonprofit uh, campaign that I organized here uh, in Rhode Island seven years ago that we continue to run, um, and it was designed as a team-based uh, wellness competition. And Dr. Trisha Leahy has been studying uh, this program and the participants in this program for several years, and she's going to share with us uh, some of the research that she's published and some of the interesting findings uh, that, she, that she learned around how social influence affects health. I'll then talk briefly about uh, what all this research and what these findings mean uh, for population health management for those of us who are focused on how do we take large populations of people and improve their health in a sustainable way. And then I'll share with you some, some ideas that I have for how you can specifically leverage this knowledge and this research to achieve success in your own organization. We'll then end, as Sean mentioned, with a question and answer period, and you'll have the opportunity to ask questions to Dr. Matthews, Dr. Leahy, and myself, and we'll look forward to that discussion part of the webinar. So let's go ahead and get started. I'd now like to uh, turn the call over to Dr. Luke Matthews, who uh, will take us through his research and his ideas about the spread of human behavior in large social networks. Dr. Matthews? Thank you, Rajiv. 
So let me first introduce uh, who Activate Networks is as a company. Um, we're a social network analytics company. Uh, our management team has, a, has prior experience in building and leading large health companies. And our technology in the health space comes from the Christakis Laboratory. We've licensed uh, technology, uh, analytical insights from 15 years of research at Harvard um, uh, by the Christakis and, and Fowler Lab. Uh, you may have heard of this research uh, from their best-selling book, Connected, where uh, Drs. Christakis and Fowler uh, discuss the uh, incredibly powerful uh, effects that social networks have on many aspects of human life. Next slide. Now, the essential insight of um, Connected and um, that we use to um, create social network analytic technology is that human behaviors are contagious. That includes good behaviors and bad behaviors. So it includes individuals' lifestyle choices, um, clinical practice patterns by doctors, medication use by patients, fraud and criminal behaviors, purchasing patterns, and many other aspects of human life pass along ties of a personal social relationship between individuals. The structure of all those relationships together constitute a social network connecting us all. And so what I'd like to, you to start doing is to think about the health of people in your company as a collective phenomenon, not just a characteristic of individuals. Next slide. So we've long recognized that human life has, has this collective aspect where we have uh, behaviors that have a, uh, an existence that's more than the sum of all the parts of the individuals just added up. And so that includes our religious and political institutions and beliefs, our taste in athletics or fashion, or use of safety helmets, use of social media. Uh, so in, for all of these behaviors, it, it's clear that we're influenced by lots of other people. We have some kind of influence on those around us. And in fact, people can come and go in and out of the system but the, the, the religious or political or social media system can kind of have a life that's somewhat independent, that's out of its own, that it can perpetuate itself through these patterns of social influence in a social network. And so start to think about the health of your company that way. Health isn't just a trait that individuals carry around with them, where they have a disease or they don't, or they're fit or they're not fit. Um, they come into your company and they have effects on the health of other people at the company. The overall health of the company, uh, the physical wellness and and, and um, uh, psychiatric wellness of people at the company affects them. And so they leave their mark and the company leaves a mark on them as they come in and out. Now the mechanics of this, thank you, were, were first laid out really well in the health space by uh, the pioneering research of Nicholas Rousakis and James Fowler. Uh, they addressed the role of social networks on health in the Framingham Heart Study data set. Now the Framingham Heart Study was originally started as a long-term study uh, to address the predictors on that sort of individual uh, trait basis, the predictors of heart disease, other chronic conditions of aging. So they followed people for decades. Um, but in the process of doing this, um, the, the many researchers involved in the Framingham Heart Study collected social network information. And what I mean by that is information about relationships. So in the map you see before you, you see individual people depicted as nodes or these dots um, on the map. And the ties between them, the lines connecting the individuals, reflect some kind of social relationship. In this case, the map shows uh, ties of friendship and spousal relationships. So what Nicholas and James did was they, they mapped a whole set of health traits, starting with obesity, um, onto the social network of Framingham. On this map, the size of the individual nodes or dots uh, reflects uh, an individual's body mass index, um, how, how overweight they are. And if a node is colored yellow, it means that they're above the level considered obese. And you can see in Framingham, obesity is quite common, as it is in much of the US. What Christophe and Fowler found is that obesity also clusters in the network. So individuals are um, likely to be connected to other individuals who have similar BMI. Obese individuals are connected to other obese individuals. Um, thinner individuals are connected to thinner individuals. But it's not just that people are forming and dissolving friendships on the basis of their obesity. Really, we think most of the effect is actually that changes in obesity are affecting your friends. Next slide, please. Now, these effects ripple out not just, not just to your immediate friends, but beyond those immediate friends. So to drill down, um, these, this is one of the key findings from the Christophe and Fowler research. Uh, 
at a social distance of one, where you see the bar graphs for a social distance of one, those are someone's immediate friends. And what this graphic is showing you is that one, when someone's immediate friend um, gained weight, that individual is then 50% more likely to subsequently become obese themselves. So when your friend becomes obese, at least in the Framingham data set, um, the individual uh, with, the, with the tied friendship was then 50% more likely to become obese at a subsequent time point. So it's not even that something is happening that's causing these friends together to become obese. It's, it's that the friend becomes obese and then, and then, and then the, uh, the individual becomes obese later. Now this effect extends certainly out to two degrees of separation, a social distance of two, that's a friend of a friend, and there even seems to be some effect out to three degrees of separation, a friend of a friend of a friend. Uh, beyond that, we don't see too much of a cascading effect through the network of individuals gaining weight and, and influencing the weight of individuals who are, are more than three degrees away from them. And there's several other um, key uh, hallmarks in the Framingham data set that, that lead us to believe um, quite strongly that this is a social influence process, that health is spreading through the network. If we can move to the next slide, you can see um, an example um, network that illust can illustrate this point. Now, looking at this network, suppose a lethal disease were spreading throughout the, the nodes of this network. Which of the highlighted nodes would you most want to be? Well, a sensible choice would be to be, uh, pick node A. Node A is connected by only really two other individuals to the whole bulk of the network. So as long as the lethal disease doesn't hit one of his two connections that brings him into the rest of the network, he's going to survive. He's not going to catch the disease. Right? It's possible he could catch the disease, but on average, node A is much more isolated and less likely to catch a lethal disease spreading through this network. Conversely, if a really good piece of gossip were spreading through the network that you wanted to know about, who would you want to be? Well, a good pick would be to be node C. Node C is highly central in the network, so there's a short path from him to everyone else in the network on average. On average, he has a shorter distance uh, to everyone else in the network than A, B, or D. And so on average, as gossip passes through the network, C is always going to know about it first. C is also going to catch lethal diseases first. He'll catch anything passing through the network first. So that's the thing. Both good and bad things can pass through the network. And this is observed uh, of, a, of a good health behavior spreading through the network is also observed in Framingham. Next slide. So Drs. Krasox and Fowler also found that smoking cessation moved through the network. Um, the graphics you see here are showing the same individuals in 1971 and 2000, but in this case, it's not showing BMI and obesity, it's showing smoker status. So the larger yellow nodes are smokers, and the smaller green nodes are non-smokers. And remember, these are the same individuals from 1971 to 2000. They've rearranged some of their network ties a bit, but the overall network structure is quite similar. Uh, but what's really dramatic is that most smokers converted over into being non-smokers by 2000. And this conversion into being non-smokers didn't happen at random across the network. In fact, it happened in just the way I described, that central people became non-smokers faster. Next slide. So this was quantified quite nicely by Christox and Fowler. And you can see that as time went on, those are examination numbers. So these individuals were brought in for exams at um, periods of a couple year intervals. And so as time went on, the non-smokers were trending towards being more highly central. But what's very clear is that smokers were increasingly more the more and more peripheral people because the spreading wave of smoking cessation, of quitting smoking, hadn't caught up to those extreme peripheral parts of the network yet. So more, uh, spreading out from the center, all these individuals were quitting smoking. And uh, by the end of the time period, the only smokers who are left are a bunch of pretty peripheral individuals in the network because the smoking cessation hasn't gotten to that spot of the network yet. That's a very specific prediction made by um, social influence spreading uh, the smoking cessation throughout the network. Next slide. Now, there are many other behaviors that have been shown to spread in this way, health behaviors that have been shown to spread in this way on social networks. At Framingham, the Christakis uh, team has also shown that uh, alcohol use and, and non-use uh, has a social network characteristic. Depression spreads across social networks. And these sorts of results have been replicated now in other populations and by other researchers. So how at Activate Networks do we take this, these, these scientific insights to leverage that into a 
social network analytic technology for em employers who want to spread wellness among their employee population. I'm going to lay out the basic steps that we do so you have a very clear idea about how, how this science can really be very directly applied to uh, your wellness concerns at, among your employees. So first, we construct a social network map that identifies all the employees, their relationships, including identifying the more influential employees, the influencees, and the overall influence patterns in the network. In doing this, we overlay health information for specific health behaviors that uh, are of interest uh, to the employer to mitigate, like weight loss or smoking cessation or other characteristics, um, and even just participation. A big factor in a successful program is just getting engagement up in a wellness program. By doing this, we can create a highly focused outreach. And the, these, the outreach is based on two basic network engineering techniques. One technique is to strategically build new ties and plan teams based on the existing pattern of relationship that we see among the employees of the company. I'm not going to go into detail about that because Dr. Leahy has a whole terrific study that she's going to tell you about where they did uh, an experimental uh, study of team memberships and their effects uh, on wellness. The other basic network engineering technique that we use is to identify and target individuals who are key to influence patterns in the network specific to the trait that, the, that you want to spread, whether that's engagement or, or weight loss, et cetera. Next slide. This is an example of an of a analysis we did for a client who was interested in spreading uh, both greater engagement in wellness programming and spreading weight loss. Uh, the, the client had a, a nationwide distribution with employees at multiple sites. And the social network map that you see, individuals are colored by the location of where they're where they're stationed, and the size of the nodes reflect their BMI, their body mass index. There's clearly clustering of, of body mass index um, in the network, both by location, but also based on just ties of relationship. We found that in this uh, uh, large employee population, that uh, body mass index correlated significantly across network ties, as in Framingham, and also as in Framingham, that changes in body mass index correlated across network ties. So when an individual's uh, friend, who was also an employee, gained weight, they were subsequently more likely to gain weight. This is really a novel finding, um, not just replicating Framingham, in that these aren't just all friends and family and spouses and people's closest uh, relationships. These are coworkers. These are people who are identified as friends or close relationships at the office. Uh, so it's really, uh, it's really important to show that that those sorts of relationships also have network effects on health. And um, in this large uh, employee population, they clearly did. After doing this analysis, we were able to identify a, a comprehensive list of who the most influential people were within their local area of the network, uh, who were most connected to other people that needed to engage in wellness or needed to lose weight, and who were central to their local network community. Next slide. So these network approaches of, of building new ties strategically and strategically targeting the most influential people can help with two key issues in corporate wellness programs. They can increase engagement for those who are not engaged in any kind of wellness programming right now. And they can also increase sustainability and the efficacy of the program for those who are already uh, engaged. So whether that's just getting people to keep checking in and keep engaging in the program, or also achieving specific goals, helping them get to that weight loss goal that they have, uh, both of these network engineering techniques can help immensely in doing that. So at this point, I think we're going to turn the presentation over to uh, Dr. Leahy. Thank you so much, uh, Luke. Uh, wonderful to see that portion of the presentation. And I think you know we've all heard a lot about the research that Dr. Christakis and Dr. Fowler have done, but uh, I think you really helped us to, to dive deeper into it and really understand what it's saying and what it means uh, for those of us who are trying to spread good health through our population. So thank you so much for taking us through that. I, I anticipate that there are going to be some good questions for you uh, at the end of the webinar so we can continue that conversation. Um, now uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Trisha Leahy, uh, who's a researcher at the Weight Control and Diabetes Research Center. And she's going to talk to us about what she found about social influence in a team-based wellness program. 
So, uh, Dr. Leahy. Thank you, Rajiv. As we just saw, there's strong evidence to suggest that obesity spreads through social networks. Given our group's particular focus on obesity treatment, we wanted to examine whether these same social influence processes operate to promote weight loss. In addition, because no one had yet examined whether the social components of wellness campaigns had any effect on outcomes, we sought to test whether social influence affected weight loss and changes in physical activity within the context of Shape Up Rhode Island, a team-based wellness campaign. Before I present those results, let me just tell you a little bit about Shape Up Rhode Island. It's an annual workplace wellness campaign that aims to promote weight loss and physical activity. Thousands of individuals join Shape Up Rhode Island each year in teams of 5 to 11 members and compete with other teams on weight loss and increasing activity. During the 12-week Shape Up program, participants receive access to an online tracking platform where, they're, where they track their, and view their personal progress and their team's progress relative to other teams. They also receive weekly newsletters designed to promote healthy eating and physical activity. And in addition, this program offers some community events, such as exercise classes and cooking demonstrations that are designed to engage participants in new healthy lifestyle changes. Using data from the 2007 campaign, we examined the effects of this program on weight loss and exercise. We found that Shape Up Rhode Island yields a significant weight loss of 3.7 kilograms, with 30% of Shape Up participants achieving a clinically significant or 5% weight loss. In addition, Shape Up Rhode Island yielded a significant increase in physical activity. Participants increased their number of pedometer steps by over 2,000 from the beginning of the program to program end. Activity increases of this magnitude are associated with improvements in blood pressure, cholesterol, and glucose tolerance. So are obviously quite significant. Okay, so let me move into the social network effects. What are the effects of these social network or team components of this program on weight loss and activity out outcomes? Our results show that team members did indeed influence individual weight loss outcomes. Specifically, weight loss tended to cluster within teams meaning that individuals on the same team tended to achieve similar weight losses. This effect was evidenced by a significant interclass correlation, which was consistent with a medium effect. So these findings suggest that weight loss is, contag is contagious in team-based wellness programs. Once we knew that weight loss tended to cluster within teams, we then wanted to examine team or social characteristics that influenced individual weight loss outcomes. We found teams reporting greater positive social influence for weight loss yielded superior weight loss outcomes, and that having more teammates in the weight loss division was associated with greater weight losses for the individual team member. We have included this graph to depict the findings. Essentially, we used our statistical model and resulting coefficients to determine how much weight loss the average Shape Up Rhode Island participant would lose if they were placed on a team with an optimal team environment versus a team with a poor team environment. As you can see, if placed on a team with an optimal team environment, meaning more positive social influence for weight loss and more teammates trying to lose weight, they would lose 5% of their initial body weight. In contrast, if that same person were placed on a team with a poor team environment, they would only lose about 3.7% of their initial body weight. We next examined whether achieving a clinically significant weight loss tended to cluster among teammates. Before I talk about those findings, I first just want to define what clinically significant weight loss is. Essentially, it's defined as losing at least 5% of initial body weight. This means, for example, that if someone weighs 200 pounds, a 10-pound weight loss would be a clinically significant weight loss. And the reason why we call it clinically significant is because that amount of weight loss has been shown to be associated with reduced risk in cardiovascular disease and diabetes. So going back to the social influence or team effects, similar to our overall weight loss results, we found that achieving a clinically significant or 5% weight loss also tended to cluster among teammates, which was evidenced by an ICC of 0.09, which is consistent with a medium effect. And our results show that network or team characteristics, again, influence the odds of an individual achieving a 5% weight loss. Specifically, having greater social influence for weight loss and more teammates in the weight loss division 
was associated with greater likelihood of achieving the 5% weight loss. So if you take a look at the graph, as before, if I were to put an individual on a team with an optimal environment, meaning high levels of social influence and teammates working towards the same health goal, their odds of achieving a 5% or clinically significant weight loss would be nearly doubled compared to, whether, compared to if that same person were placed on an average team environment, and of course even lesser if they were put on a poor team environment. Finally, we also examined whether changes in physical activity clustered among team members. And indeed, individuals on the same team tended to achieve similar physical activity outcomes. Similar to weight loss, team characteristics influence changes in physical activity. Individuals on teams who started strong and had high levels of activity in the first two weeks of Shape Up Rhode Island achieved substantially greater increases in activity compared to those who are, not, who are not on such teams. As you can see in the graph, if the same person were put on an optimal team, their physical activity would increase by over 3,500 steps per day. In contrast, if that person were put on a team with a poor environment, meaning that their teammates did not get up to a strong start, their activity levels would only increase by approximately 1,300 steps per day. Given that greater increases in physical activity are associated with greater reductions in cardiovascular disease risk, this difference created by altering the social network or team environment, environment translates to substantial cardiovascular benefit. So what are the key findings from this research? First, social networks impact both weight loss and physical activity in, in wellness programs. As such, wellness initiatives should really try to harness this effect and capitalize on the natural or organic positive social influence potential of coworkers, friends, and family. To, to enhance the weight losses and physical activity outcomes. Our data suggests that ways of promoting positive social influence in social networks may be to ensure that participants form teams based on their health goals so that everyone on the same team is in fact working to achieve the same goal, have teammates set overarching team goals, as such an approach can maximize social accountability by promoting regular reporting, giving recognition to positive role models, and therefore enhancing health behavior change. And finally, offering team building activities to promote a culture of social support and cohesion for health behavior change may promote positive social influence and thereby affect health outcomes. So where are we going with this research? First, we'd like to manipulate the team environment and conduct a randomized trial examining the effects of an optimal team versus a poor team environment on weight and activity. Second, we hope to dive deeper and better understand exactly how team members influence one another's weight loss and activity outcomes. We hypothesize that social norms, social modeling, peer accountability, and social support are promising mechanisms by which these teammates influence behavior change. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Leahy. Um, I find this research uh, fascinating, the idea that um, you can actually engineer uh, a social environment and uh, depending on how you structure that social environment uh, will influence uh, the outcomes that a person uh, achieves in a particular program. I think it's pretty, uh, pretty profound and gives all, all of us in the health promotion space a lot to think about when we're building, designing, uh, promoting, and, and implementing wellness programs. I want to uh, take a moment and just talk about what all this research that uh, was just shared with us by Dr. Matthews and Dr. Leahy means for, for those of us in population health management. Uh, first of all, you may remember back to, to 2007, Dr. Matthews covered this research to Dr. Nicholas Christakis Framingham, uh, Heart Study Obesity Research. In, in that paper, he said that social influence suggests that it may be possible to harness the same force that was spreading obesity in the Framingham population to actually slow the, the spread of obesity, and that network phenomena could actually be exploited. And it turns out that, that Dr. Christakis was right, um, you know, both the, the research and uh, work that Activate Networks has done and, and the work that Dr. Leahy has done in studying the Shape Up Rhode Island program has proven uh, that we can actually intentionally slow the spread of obesity or in fact reverse it uh, and spread healthy behaviors and healthy outcomes uh, through a social network. And it, it turns out that it's not just Activate Networks and, and Shape Up Rhode Island, it's really the whole healthcare industry has come uh, to realize the power of uh, taking a social approach to health, whether it's using social media, social networking, organizing people into groups, group-based behavior change. Um, we're starting to think about ways that we can treat individuals, not just as individuals, but as groups of people, that we can really think about those individuals in their lives that have an influence on them, and how do we leverage all of them to produce better outcomes? Because I think we can all agree that uh, the health of our nation is not moving in the right direction 
uh, I believe that the social approach offers us great promise. And so I'd like to summarize the, the key takeaways uh, from today's webinar. And again, I want to remind you that in just a moment, we're going to have an opportunity to ask questions uh, directly to Dr. Matthews, Dr. Leahy, and myself about the content that was covered here or any other uh, areas of interest that you have related to this topic. The first key takeaway, uh, and this was really shared by Dr. Matthews, is that health behaviors, like many other human behaviors, spread in social networks. We are social beings. We look at what people around us do. Uh, we take our cues from them. The people around us determine the social norms, and they have a tremendous amount of influence. And therefore, the behaviors that are related to health uh, spread from person to person. And what that means is that unhealthy outcomes can spread. And we heard about research both about obesity spreading over the past 30 years uh, across uh, the Framingham Heart Study and really across the nation, and also uh, the, the effect on alcohol consumption uh, when it comes to uh, social networks. But again, it turns out that healthy behaviors and healthy outcomes can spread uh, smoking cessation, increased physical activity, and weight loss. So uh, even though uh, the spread of obesity has really uh, brought us to a dire situation, uh, there's a great hope that we can leverage the same forces that spread unhealthy behaviors, harness them to spread healthy outcomes. What that means is that interventions that target key influencers are more likely to achieve maximum engagement and activity. If we can identify and target the individuals that are most central in the network, that have the most social influence over the people around them, we can be more successful. We can leverage those individuals to help us achieve our goals of improving the health of a population. And that's really the work that uh, Dr. Matthews is talking about that Activate Networks does so well. And that interventions that promote social influence, teamwork, and shared goals are likely to produce better outcomes. Historically in the healthcare space, we've seen so many interventions that focus on, on people as individuals, and they single them out and treat them in, in, in a one-on-one -on -one capacity. But really, we need to open our minds to the idea that uh, perhaps group-based behavior change is a better way to go. Perhaps group coaching, I've been hearing a lot about uh, new group coaching programs that are coming out, is a more effective way uh, to intervene than individual coaching programs. So the research here suggests that if we take a social approach to our health interventions, uh, we're likely to produce better outcomes uh, for the people that we're trying to help. And so how can you take this knowledge and leverage it uh, to achieve success in your organization? Well, I came up with uh, seven ideas uh, for how you can do that. Um, and I think they're going to go out of order. So um, the, the, the one is to um, really focus on organizing teams and groups uh, for wellness. So whether it's online, offline, when you're running your wellness program, think about how you can uh, get people working together on teams uh, and on groups. The second thing you can do is you can actually map the social network of your population. And, and Dr. Matthews talked briefly about this. I hope in the Q&A we might be able to talk or touch upon this in greater detail. But you can actually learn how people are connected, how closely they're connected within your population, who is at the periphery of the network, who's at the center of the network. Once you know that, you can actually leverage those individuals and facilitate peer-to-peer -peer recruitment through those influencers. What we know from our experience is that people are much more likely to join a wellness program when they're invited by somebody they know and trust and are influenced by. So we need to identify those people and leverage them to help us get the word out. You can also utilize competitions to organize and motivate. Uh, we've seen that through the Shape Up Rhode Island program and the data that was just presented. Uh, competitions provide structure, they give people a reason to participate, and they can really motivate uh, individuals to work together to improve their health. It's not enough to just organize teams and groups, as Dr. Leahy talked about. We really need to promote team cohesion and team building. Um, so think about how within your organization, within your wellness program, you can go beyond just getting people together, but really helping them work together, helping them communicate, helping them share, uh, helping them to coach and support each other uh, is really the, the way that we're going to produce the best outcomes. Well, it's also to remember that we have to share results and, and provide comparisons to promote accountability. A lot of what makes people successful when they're on a team is they feel accountable to that team. When their team members can see their results, they can see whether or not they continue to be active, whether they're moving in the right direction. Uh, we need people to be able to see those results. And so whether it's online or offline, make sure you're thinking about how uh, to share the results within reason and obviously um, protecting uh, health information that's private, but uh, wherever possible, let people share what they're doing and, and share how they compare against others in their organization. And then finally, we hear a lot about financial incentives, and most of the financial incentives that are being offered by employers, by health plans, are individual financial incentives. There are financial incentives that go to one person for taking an action that's personal and individual. Think about how you can link financial incentives to social actions. Team goals, for example. Perhaps individuals on a team only get 
uh, the incentive if the entire team reaches a common goal that they've set forth at the beginning of the program. Or team outcomes. Maybe if the entire team completes the program, uh, that's what triggers the financial incentive. You can leverage your financial incentive dollars to produce a greater outcome with even lesser amounts of money uh, by linking financial incentives to these uh, social endeavors. I want to take a quick moment before we go to the, the Q&A period uh, to make a quick plug. Um, we at ShapeUp are hosting or conducting a survey. It's called the Employer Health and Technology Survey. And we're trying to understand the answer to the question, how is technology shaping the way that you help your employees to manage their health? Uh, we're getting a lot of fascinating responses. Uh, employers are on all ends of the spectrum. Some are on, in the middle, some are on opposite ends. We want to hear from you. Is it working? Is it not? Um, how are you using technology uh, to empower your employees? The survey takes 10 minutes. We've timed it. Uh, we know that a lot of people say that they have a short survey and then it takes 30 minutes. Uh, it really is a short survey online. And uh, if you do take it, you'll have a chance to win a Fitbit uh, personal physical activity calorie sleep tracker. Uh, and it's a pretty cool device. And we're going to be giving out five uh, Fitbit devices uh, randomly to people who complete the survey. So I think we have about, Sean, 300, uh, a little over 300 companies that have taken the survey. Uh, if your company is of any size, um, from, from two to, um, to 100,000 employees we want or more, we want you to take the survey. Um, Sean is sending you a link in the uh, GoToMeeting uh, dialog box. You should have that link. Feel free to click on the link, fill the survey. Uh, we'll share with you an early advanced copy of the results. And we partnered with uh, Context Communication Consulting, um, who's helping us to, to do this research and to, to share the results with all of you. So with that, I'd like to, first of all, thank you for your attention and, and for joining us for the webinar. And now we'd like to open it up to questions that have come in. All right, thank you, uh, Rajiv, Trisha, and Luke. Great presentations today. Um, I did just chat out the link to the survey. Um, so if you're in charge of running wellness at your company, and, and as we just said, if you're a company of any size, we'd love to hear from you. We're, we're really trying to, to benchmark some of the best practices of the use of technology and wellness. So we have had a lot of great questions come in. Um, there's, there's a pretty good variety here, too, and there's a lot more rolling in. We'll, we'll get to as many as we can um, today. And uh, those that we don't get to, we'll, we'll, we'll follow up with you personally by email. So um, let me just address one quick question that uh, typically comes up first. Um, the slides and the archive of today's event, we will make those available. Um, and as soon as they are, we'll send a link out to you guys via email. Uh, and you can access it on demand at any point. Um, so first question, uh, and there's a couple that tie in here. So let me just see um, if we can maybe, maybe tie them in. But um, first question goes to, to Dr. Luke Matthews. Um, how do you identify who the key influencers are when you are geographically dispersed? So I think that came up when you were showing um, the slide of the dispersed population in, in the multiple office locations. When you're doing something like that, how do you identify who the key influencers are in each office? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Thanks for asking it. Um, we can, uh, depending on the structure of the intervention, uh, if it's company-wide, um, we will build an overall model that incorporates the effect of the, the location and the independent effect of the relationship ties. So what we, in fact, have always found with the, with the projects that we've done and with the, the research from the Christakis Laboratory is that those two things are related, but that there's a lot of social influence and social relationship in the network that exists that crosses uh, location boundaries. So you really want to leverage both of those uh, when you then decide um, who are the most influential people, that the, the people who are most connected to other people who are, who are relevant targets and who are central and, and in a, a kind of leadership role within their local um, network community, not just the, their physical location. Okay, thank you, Dr. Matthews. Um, there's a follow-up question there uh, that, that I'm going to, there's a couple that are similar here, so I'm going to try just to, to summarize it, one question to you. Um, when you're talking about mapping employee networks, can, can you give us a little bit more detail about uh, the process of, of how you do this, how, how your company goes about this? Sure. Uh, so the, the one technique that's sort of been a standard technique for years for mapping any social network is to conduct a survey. It's typically called a name generator survey. And you go and you ask people, uh, you know, write down your, your five closest friends at the company, or who would you go to for health advice, who would you do a physical activity with, et cetera. Um, Original research that we did here at Activate Networks uh, shows that we can get a lot of that same information out of communications traffic. Uh, we've looked at email uh, especially because it's such a common communication mode for companies. So just using 
the uh, the two from the to and from email addresses and the the timestamp for the communication, we can build a social network based on that. We have proprietary algorithms um, that we have shown um, can extract uh, a social network very similar to those survey networks um, from just email communication traffic. Um, you can do it with really any kind of uh, communication. It's just email is still the most common thing for uh, intra-office um, uh, communication. So there, there's a variety of tools out there. They have pros and, and, and cons. Um, again, with email, we don't need to look at any text or subject lines or any of that stuff. Um, the other bit of information that a lot of employers are sitting on, perhaps without realizing it's social network information, is information about project teams who's worked on projects together, um, information from 360 reviews or, or those sorts of surveys where people are evaluating uh, coworkers, and, and sometimes those are done in such a way that they it just asks people, well, who have you worked with a lot in the past year? Well, that doesn't just produce ratings of someone's performance. It also produces social network information of who's been working with each other. OK, thank you, Dr. Matthews. Next question is for Dr. Leahy. Um, you talked about how higher social influence led to higher weight loss. How was that social influence actually measured? Thanks for that. Thanks for that question. Um, so basically what we did is near the end of the Shape Up Rhode Island program, we had everybody answer a survey that assessed um, basically their positive social influence for weight loss within their team environment. And higher scores on that survey, of course, indicated that their team had um, a better, more positive and supportive uh, environment relative to uh, lower scores. Okay, thank you, Dr. Leahy. Um, another question for you. Uh, do you have any insights on whether randomly assigning team participants versus forming your own team has an influence on behavior change outcomes? And this is assuming that the team is working towards the same goal. That's an interesting question. I mean, I think that there's something um, potentially powerful about natural networks. You know, we choose our, our our social contacts and for a variety of reasons. Um, so, you know, and that can cut both ways as we've seen in this presentation. So you can choose somebody that could be potentially helpful, but you might also choose social contacts that might not be so helpful. So, you know, if we were to choose our own networks, I think we run the risk of potentially having um, some negative social influence for weight loss or some other health goal. However, if we are to actually kind of manufacture an optimal team environment by including people you know, um, but also including people and um, having components that we know will maximize positive social influence for health behavior change, I think that we have a better chance of really exploiting and harnessing the social influence potential of social networks. So this is Dr. Kumar. So Dr. Leahy, if we take someone who has, let's say, a lower level of physical activity and we put them with people whom they know but have higher levels of physical activity and put them on a team together. That would be an example um, in your mind of leveraging existing social connections but optimizing the characteristics that we know that promote better outcomes. Exactly, exactly. And I, you know, I, I do think I would be somewhat careful to make sure that we're not putting individuals um, with others just based on the social psychological psychological findings that are, you know, marathon runners or somebody sedentary. So you want to be able to um, you know, put them in the right social environment so that it's motivating and not demoralizing, but um, inspiring. Yeah, your comment made me think about um, the article that was in the Wall Street Journal uh, just a couple weeks back that was called The Colleagues Who Make You Fat. And it was talking about how there are these people in our social environment, especially at work, that, um, that guilt trip us into eating unhealthy food or having a slice of cake when it's somebody's birthday so we don't uh, hurt their feelings. And so it's true that the people that uh, we're close to are not always our best allies uh, when it comes to improving our health. So it is important to think about who we actually associate with and uh, when we design these interventions, how do we group people who are going to help each other as opposed to drag each other down. Exactly. Okay, thank you, Rajiv. Uh, and Dr. Leahy, um, next question. I'll, I'll throw this one to Rajiv first, um, and then if the uh, other participants want to jump in as well. Um, how did you come up with the 5 to 11 number for team members? That's a, that's a great question. Um, that was a, um, I want to say it was a somewhat random selection uh, based on trial and error. But we looked at um, what team sizes were generally in various sports. Um, and so that was, uh, that was part of where we kind of got a ballpark um, team size. We knew we didn't want 20 people on a team, that we thought the team would start to splinter off. 
um, and form multiple smaller teams. We also knew that not everybody sticks with any health intervention. And traditionally, most health interventions have very high attrition rates. So we knew that if we went to four or three people, if one or two individuals stopped participating or disengaged, that team would no longer be a team. So we found that middle ground between five and 11 um, just to really be um, the right amount of, of team members uh, to really help power the, the, the group to success. We also found that it was burdensome for the team captains to have to go out and recruit uh, more than 10 people. That was really, at a team size of 11, they really felt like they, they just wasn't enough time and it was just too much effort to keep getting more and more people on their team. So uh, it was really uh, the people in the program told us uh, what worked best for them. We, looked, we observed uh, what was happening in other sports and other games that we knew of. Um, and then we've been studying this and it turns out that it actually is a pretty good um, size and range for teams. Um, what we have found in some of the data that we've looked at is it appears that some of the larger teams uh, achieve greater weight losses um, in greater physical activity. And I think that that may be simply due to a motivated team captain uh, who goes out and recruits a lot of people and is highly motivated to help power that team to success. Um, but we haven't looked very seriously at what is the optimal team size. It's a really good question and it's something that we're hoping to study in the future. Thank you, Rajiv. Uh, I'll throw the next question out to both Dr. Leahy and Dr. Matthews. Um, Dr. Leahy, if you want to answer first. Um, do so-called key influencers need to be senior management in order to positively influence behavior change? You know, I'm not sure that I'm actually the best one to answer that question, but um, I, I think it might uh, be better um, with our, our other presenter. Um, but, you know, I, I do think that it's important to find somebody who has the social capital to potentially um, then be able to be as influential as we want them to be and to promote whatever it is we're aiming to, to promote. Yeah, if I, if I could jump in there. Um, I, think, I think the answer is, the question was whether key influencers have to be at a, a management level. Um, and, and the basic answer is uh, no, they don't have to not be at management level, but they don't have to be management either. Um, first, um, keep in mind when we pick key influencers, it's not just based on the network, it's based on how the trait that you want to affect lays on that network. So whether that's engagement in wellness programming or weight loss or more activity. Um, there's, you don't go to the same person for advice about everything. You don't look to the same person for a model for everything, right? For certain traits you look to some people, for other traits, you look to other people who you know personally, who are all within your local network. Um, and we find for, for wellness, um, but as well as a variety of business issues, we have an entire organizational network analysis division that works on business management issues. There's often key influencers and people who are key to any work getting done at a company who, who are not necessarily at a, at a high management level, but they, they're, they're, just, they're just great social networkers. They know the right people, they know how to connect to the right people, uh, and they're looked to by, by those around them. Uh, thank you both, Dr. Leahy and Dr. Matthews. Um, next question that just came in, are you evaluating sustained weight loss, uh, for example, six months, six months post-program? So we have actually, um, in the um, obesity study that was first published uh, back in 2009, which was based on 2007 data, we, uh, six months after the four-month intervention, um, surveyed the individuals and asked about their uh, current weight at that time. And we actually found that 73% of the weight loss, of the original weight loss during the intervention had been maintained uh, six months after. So 10 months from time zero, 73% um, of the weight loss had been maintained. And what's interesting is we wonder, you know, why? That seems pretty high. Uh, most weight loss interventions six months after um, uh, see that people regain almost all of the weight. And what we're hypothesizing is that because people are doing this together as a team in a social approach, they're actually modifying their social network. Um, their, their social network is now uh, understanding of the goal they're trying to achieve, perhaps actually worked with them to achieve that goal, maybe even shares a common goal, and so that they can actually be more conducive and create a more supportive environment to maintaining that behavior change over time. If we go and we, we go to a, a retreat to lose weight um, somewhere far away in a remote location, and then we come back into our obesogenic environment, which is really what most of us live in, uh, suddenly our colleagues are, like the Wall Street Journal talked about, making us fat and our, uh, our, our family members are bringing unhealthy food into the home and um, our colleagues are saying, let's go for happy hour and let's go for half price appetizers after work and you know, we're not necessarily promoting healthy behaviors, but uh, if we actually announce to the world what we're trying to do and the people around us are working together, 
we're modifying the social environment. And that's really my hypothesis for why um, there's greater sustainability over time uh, for uh, weight loss outcomes that are achieved in a social fashion. Uh, we obviously have a lot more work to do in researching uh, sustainability of these outcomes. Um, and I know that we're going to be working with uh, Dr. Leahy, Dr. Wing, and their team to, um, to look at some of that sustained uh, weight loss over time. Thank you, Rajiv. Uh, next question actually comes back to you, um, and it's two parts, but uh, the first is, are there good web platforms for creating networks like this within organizations across multiple sites? And then as a follow-up, that same person also asked, are there non-web strategies you would suggest for creating these networks? Sure. Well, I think there are general enterprise social networking tools that are proliferating. Uh, you may have heard of Yammer or Jive, uh, if you use Salesforce at your organization, Chatter. These are general uh, social tools within organizations that are allowing uh, individuals to collaborate and share, and those can certainly be leveraged um, for health purposes. There are obviously uh, companies like ShapeUp uh, that are doing that specifically for health and wellness, where uh, we host platforms that allow individuals to invite their colleagues to form uh, common uh, form teams and goal uh, groups around common goals, to compete, to track each other's progress. Uh, to support each other, hold each other accountable, um, and try to take the social approach. And so um, there are specific online platforms, both non-health and health-related, uh, that are designed to harness the power of social connections within your population. Um, and we're going to see more and more of those um, platforms and applications uh, come on the scene. I think in terms of informal uh, ways to organize, there are lots of ways to do that. Um, what, what we've seen in a lot of uh, large companies is the organic creation of intramural sports leagues um, where employees are, are forming uh, teams and, and tournaments and leagues around their common sports interests. And whether it's um, softball or uh, soccer or baseball or whatever it might be, um, that's one example of an offline um, social wellness program where people are forming teams and competing and holding each other accountable and cheering each other on. Um, and using that type of initiative to stay active. So I think the, the sky is the limit when, when we talk about offline um, group-based behavior change interventions. And um, if, if we think creatively, we'll realize that even, even something like intramural sports leagues uh, is an example of that. Thank you, Rajiv. Um, we have a few minutes left here, and we have a few questions left. But if you do have uh, any more questions, feel free to type them in. And uh, if we don't get them to, to them live today, we'll, uh, we'll follow up with you. Uh, Two questions that came in that, are, that, that go hand in hand uh, for Dr. Leahy. Um, what do you believe to be the most important quality of a successful team, uh, either similar goals or pre-established friendship? And then somebody else asked, um, can you talk a little bit more about what makes a team successful? Sure. These are great questions. Um, so first of all, I think you have to have team cohesion in order for any um, social influence to spread or to transmit. Amongst, amongst individuals. So, you know, if, if you think about if you're not in a supportive environment, you're not very emotionally connected to the people you're working with, um, you know, you, you're probably less likely to be influenced by these individuals. So I think cohesion is critical. Um, and in terms of optimizing the team environment once you have cohesion, I would really um, argue that y you have to focus on a shared norm or social norm. So create a culture of um, of behavior change. So what do we expect from one another? What do we expect in terms of a weight loss goal? Is it one pound per week? Is, you know, what do we expect in terms of physical activity goal? And then um, holding each other accountable to those expectations. Everybody report in on a regular basis on their weight loss goal, their physical activity goal, to, and help to support each other to reach, to reach those efforts. So I, I think that by doing that, by holding each other accountable, so you have the support, you have the social norm, and you have the accountability. I think it could be potentially quite powerful. All right, thank you, Dr. Leahy. Um, next question um, for Rajiv, uh, for Dr. Kumar. Um, for Shape Up Rhode Island, do you, feel that it, do you feel that they need to change the challenge every year so that you can keep people's interest? And then were the individuals in the study that Dr. Leahy talked about um, volunteers to participate? And did they make any type of commitment when they started? Yeah, great question. So um, on the first part, we've been running this program now for seven years here in the state of Rhode Island. And we host it as an annual campaign. And what's fascinating is every year we think about how do we change the program and how do we keep it fresh and how do we make it exciting. But what we hear again and again from the people who participate 
um, and really we get about 15,000 people uh, to do the program every year, is that they like the fact that it stays the same, um, that this has become sort of a tradition that they look forward to participating in, and uh, almost like uh, people get ready for a particular sport each season, and um, you know they, they, they look forward to that part of the year. Um, this has become something that they, they, they remember, they look forward to, they start to plan for in advance. And so if we change it too dramatically, um, we, uh, we kind of throw them off a little bit. So we've, we've actually kept the program pretty similar. We do obviously add new, new features and functionality and new content uh, to keep it fresh and interesting, but the core intervention uh, remains the same and we find that um, that's where we achieve the most success. Um, on the, Sean, remind me, the second question was, were they volunteers? Were they, were they volunteers? Were they volunteers? Yeah, so these are all people who are voluntarily participating um, in the program. There's no mandatory participation. Uh, it's largely a workplace wellness program, so we have hundreds of employers here in Rhode Island, large employers that are self-insured, smaller employers that are fully insured, um, that are making the program available to their employees, sponsoring their participation in it, um, but all of it is, is voluntary. There are employers that offer financial incentives, uh, in the form of premium reductions and HSA contributions and prizes, uh, but the vast majority of employers are actually not offering financial incentives um, for the program, and, and people are still um, participating in, in very high numbers. So they are indeed all voluntary. Okay, uh, we'll uh, finish up with um, a couple of questions that are fairly similar here today, and, and I'll throw them out to um, any of the participants who want to answer them. Um, First is, how can we keep key influencers interest that they don't become quote unquote bored when they're not being challenged by their team? Um, and this also goes hand in hand with another question. Um, how do we make the programs exciting enough not to be constant white noise throughout the year for our workplace wellness? I'll take uh, at least the first part. First, um, so how do we keep people engaged who are maybe key influencers? Uh, who are highly motivated and, and maybe their team members are not as motivated or they happen to join a poor team environment, a uh, less optimal team environment, um, as Dr. Leahy described. What we've done specifically on our platform is we've tried to create opportunities for those individuals to then venture out and find others who are highly motivated uh, to, to interact with. So these individuals on the Shape Up platform, for example, can create their own challenges and can invite anybody they'd like to. So even if they're on a team and they're participating in, let's say, a weight loss challenge, if that's not motivating them or challenging them or they're not feeling engaged, uh, they can go and create their own challenge on any topic they'd like. And they can invite whoever they like within their company um, to participate in that challenge. We also have the challenges focused on individuals where every week we ask the entire platform to try to track one specific action every day for seven days. And that could be something like try to walk a certain number of steps this week, it could be something like take the stairs instead of the elevator every day this week. It could be something like keep a food diary every day this week. But they're individual actions. So if somebody is not necessarily succeeding on their team or they ended up on a less than optimal team, uh, there are lots of opportunities to keep that individual who is motivated, activated, and give them opportunities. And then any comments on, uh, uh, I think that probably goes hand in hand with making wellness programs exciting is you're not pushing that information out, but, but the team is, and, and they're engaging each other. Any, any further comments on that? Yeah, exactly. I think it's the top-down programming, like the Shape Up Rhode Island program that Dr. Leahy described, is important. We have to create structure and create rules and create events that give people an opportunity and really permission to participate. But we also have to leverage the grassroots and, and the user-generated content creation. And one example that I used is the creation of, of challenges where I can go and create my own challenge. And one, one example that I like to use is um, I'm personally trying to reduce my consumption of diet soda. And uh, it hasn't been going so well. And so my colleagues will create challenges for me uh, to reduce my consumption of, of Diet Coke. And that's highly personalized, highly relevant to me. The platform would never create it. Shape Up Rhode Island would never create that challenge because we don't know really what people, you know, that, at that granular level what people are trying to do. Um, but my colleagues and my friends and family do know. So if we give people the tools to generate their own content, that's how we can truly keep a wellness program fresh and interesting and sustain engagement over a long period of time. It's really, we have to create those tools um, to allow people to do that. And I'll use the analogy of Facebook, for example. Facebook does not create any content whatsoever. All the content that you see when you log in is generated by your friends, your family, your kids, your grandparents. Um, the photos, they're tagging, the stories, the events, the comments. 
the links they're sharing, all that is organic and driven by the user base. And it's so engaging that people come back again and again. And in fact, 80% of all Facebook users, and they're closing in on 800 million um, users, they're gonna have a billion users soon, 80% um, of all of them use the platform uh, every single month. And the reason they're getting pulled back in and again, and it's sustainable and continues to be engaging, is there is all this highly relevant, localized, personal content being generated by their social network. Thank you, Rajiv. Uh, we're just a minute over time here, but we do have one last question left, so uh, we'll go ahead and answer it. And again, please feel free to type yours in in the meantime. Um, do you see a difference in competition from different types of employees? Uh, for example, do less fit employees shy away from team competition? Well, we definitely see that uh, different personality profiles um, react differently to competitions. Um, it actually turns out that it's not true that less fit employees are less likely to compete. In fact, when we look at uh, across uh, our population, the average body mass index of a user in our program uh, is 29.2. Um, and so really the average individual is borderline overweight obese. And in fact, that's probably slightly higher than the average body mass index uh, of the American population. And so we're getting a pretty good cross-section. We get people that are ultra fit, we get people that are kind of in the middle, and then we get people that are really not um, fit at all, and they're all signing up. So it's not really health status that seems um, to drive whether people want to participate or not. It seems more that it's personality traits, the people that are, that are competitive or like to share or work together, the people that are truly social. What we have found in past research, uh, there was research done in the 1980s by Dr. Kelly Brunell um, at Yale, who's he's now the director of the Rudd Center for Food Policy and Obesity, and his research showed that there was a gender difference in response to competition. And in fact, men preferred competitions that were more individual based, where it was each person for themselves. And the women in his studies preferred cooperative competitions, where everybody was working together uh, to achieve a certain goal. And so what we've done in our program is try to strike a middle ground by leveraging teams, which is the cooperative component, and having those teams compete, uh, which provides really that competitive component. Um, and we see that, that that really seems to be bridging that gap and engaging both men and women. And in fact, we get very high levels of male participation when we go into companies that have significant male populations um, in this wellness program, which is pretty unique when, when you think about traditional wellness programs and the fact that they're predominantly um, populated by female participants. So if there are no further questions, uh, we'd love to thank all of you for uh, your time today, for your thoughtful questions. Uh, I enjoyed the session. I want to thank uh, Dr. Luke Matthews from Activate Networks, Dr. Tricia Leahy from the Weight Control and Diabetes Research Center for taking time out of their busy schedules uh, to share with us the research they've done, uh, their insights, and their recommendations for how all of us uh, can do better at, at promoting health within our population. We'll share, as Sean mentioned, the archive uh, copy of this webinar with all of you, both the slides and the video. Uh, please feel free to share it if you have colleagues who weren't able to join. Uh, we want this to be truly social, and we want this to spread within your social network. So uh, please go ahead and feel free to share that information out. We'll be uh, looking forward to um, following up with you. If you take that survey, thank you in advance. Uh, we'll, we'll be very excited to share the results with you. I got a couple emails already on my phone uh, from folks who uh, didn't see the link or didn't get the link or had to drop off. We'll email the link to you. Um, thank you all so much. Have a wonderful day, and we'll look forward to uh, seeing you on our next webinar.